Okay, it's 633. So I think uh, it, we are going to get started. Um, so again, uh, I want to welcome everybody uh, to the Lime Forest Black Conservation Project uh, volunteer training number one. Uh, my name is Corey Folsom O'Keefe and I'm the Director of Bird Conservation for Audubon, Connecticut. And um, uh, we also have on the call uh, Eileen Fielding, who's our Director of Audubon, Sharon, and also uh, Kelly Morgan and Hugh Odelig, who are our Lime Forest Black Project Assistants. Uh, so I want to just uh, kind of give a brief, brief introduction about the Lime Forest Block Conservation Project. Uh, this is a project that takes place in the Lime Forest Block in Portonbury area, which includes the towns of Colchester, East Haddam, Salem, Lime, Old Lime, and East Lime. The important bird area is uh, important to uh, bird species such as the wood thrush that you can see on the screen in front of you, as well as the cerulean warbler and a variety of other woodland nesting birds. And over the, the last year and a half, uh, Audubon and our partners have provided presentations, bird walks, workshops, uh, and demonstrations to uh, hundreds of people who live within or visit the important bird area. Um, and those presentations were about birds, uh, their habitats, and what people can do either on their prop own properties or at local nature preserves to improve, improve habitat for birds and other wildlife in the Lyme Forest Block. The second phase of our project um, includes offering habitat assessments to private landowners and land trusts um, that are within the Lime Forest Block IBA. And the assessments will be conducted by Audubon trained volunteers. And uh, this evening's webinar is the first of our three part volunteer training series. Give me just a second here to admit, I think one more person to the, the uh, meeting. I think I got him, Corey. You got him? Perfect. Thank yeah. you, Eileen. Okay. <clears throat> You're on it from now forward, Eileen. <laughs> okay, um, so this evening we will be hearing uh, from Lime Forest Block Program Assistant Kelly Morgan on the value of volunteers and what uh, to expect as a volunteer for the Lime Forest Block Project. Uh, then I'll be talking about what a habitat assessment entails. Then Eileen Fielding uh, will be talking about why we manage woods with, for birds. And lastly, Hugh Odelig will introduce the Birders Dozen. Uh, just a few more things before we get started. If you have a question during the presentation, go ahead and write it in the chat box. Um, we'll be trying to answer the questions as we go along, but then we'll also pause between presentations to, to answer any questions that have come in in the chat box. And there should be time at the end of the presentations as well um, to answer any remaining questions. Also, I want to let everyone know that this webinar is being recorded. So if you do have to step out for a minute or two, um, you will have an opportunity to go back and see what you missed. Uh, we hope to have the uh, uh, recording up on our website uh, within a week and uh, we will definitely email everybody who's here today uh, when it is up so that you can rewatch it if you'd like. Lastly, um, I do wanna give a shout out to all of our partners and supporters. Uh, the Lime Forest Block is a group effort and we would not be able to do the work we do without their help. So, um, you know, this is really, could not do the work without all these amazing people and organizations. So um, you know, big thank you to them. So um, the next thing we're gonna do is we're actually going to do a, uh, a short little poll. And uh, I, I'm gonna show you, here's a picture of a bird and I'm gonna launch the poll. And uh, I know we haven't really taught you guys too much about identifying birds yet, but um, I'm gonna launch this poll and I'd like everybody to just give it a shot. See if you can identify this bird. Our responses are rolling in. <laughs> we'll give it another uh, 20 seconds or so, and then I'll, I'll sort of reveal the poll results. And then what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna go through all the presentations and then we'll do the poll again. And uh, hopefully by the end, <coughs> everybody will know exactly what bird this is. Okay, I'm gonna, um, Gonna end the poll now. I think we've got the majority of participants. So as you guys can see right now, wood thrush and worm eating warbler are in the lead for uh, the identity of this bird. Um, but like I said, we will uh, do the poll again at, at the end of the presentation and, and see if everybody is on the same page about the identity of this bird. Uh, and with that, I am gonna turn it over to <coughs> Kelly Morgan.
So I want to start out with thanking all of you who are on with us tonight, all of you who have signed up to be volunteers. We would not be able to do this phase of the Lime Forest Block Project without dedicated volunteers, and we are very thankful for each and every one of you. You each have your own expertise that adds so much value to our team. Many of you have shared with me some of your background, and we are thrilled to have master gardeners, environmental college students, lifetime birders, scientists, landscape designers, land trust members, and environmental educators. Some of you are landowners who want to learn how to make your yards more inviting to songbirds, and others are eager learners that want to use this training to give back to their local green spaces. We don't take your time that you are giving to this project lightly. We do know the commitment it takes to be present with us for these webinars, the work you'll put in learning bird identification, habitat features, plant identification and landscape talk context, and your willingness to go to a property with enthusiasm and do a habitat assessment for landowners who really wanna know how to create better habitat on their own property. We want you all to enjoy this learning process and to know that each of you will be an integral part of this project's success. So thank you for stepping forward and for your commitment to become champion volunteers for Audubon and the, the, um, the Lime Forest Block Conservation Project. We really appreciate you. Okay, next slide. So a habitat assessment is an inventory of current songbirds and forest habitat conditions on a property conducted by all of you, conduct uh, Audubon trained volunteers. Next slide. So we're sure that all of you really want to know exactly what we're expecting of our volunteers, like what, what we expect you to do. So here it is. Attend all three training webinars, and those are the three dates right there. Uh, we've sent out the link, you guys all have it, and that link works for all three of these evenings. Um, if you can attend a, them with us live, that would be pre preferable. Um, if you miss one, it will be recorded, like Corey said, so you can watch it later. You'll have a homework assignment after the first and second webinars. We want you to be able to take what you have learned during the webinars and go outside and learn firsthand to identify species and habitats on your own. At the end of this evening, we'll tell you what your homework assignment is and you'll be able to complete that homework assignment, email it into me, and you'll earn points towards the prize. So yay, everybody likes a prize, so you can look forward to that. Next slide. Later this summer, when things settle down, you'll join us for a walk at one of the four land trust properties for additional training. And right here, the, the properties and, and the towns that they're in um, are listed. We'll coordinate later who goes where. These properties will have already have had a habitat assessment done by Corey and a licensed forester, Eric Hansen. Corey and Eric, Eric will pin certain areas of the property where they find good examples of forest bird habitat features and characteristics. Using the Avenza app on your phone, you'll take turns finding these pinned features. This land trust walk will help solidify the knowledge you learned with the outdoor experience. Next slide. When you visit the Land Trust property, you'll receive your training material packet that will include the th things you will be bringing with you when you do your own habitat assessment on a privately owned property. The data sheet you will need to fill out, a map of the property, identification pictures, and things you'll be leaving with the landowners like good steward yard sign and information materials like the birders dozen. This is also when you will get your prize for all of your hard work and dedication. Next slide. Okay. So um, yeah, that, I'm sorry, I moved you on too quick. So, so in a nutshell, it's attend the three webinars and the two homework assignments 
visit one land trust property and do one forest bird habitat assessment on a private property. Um, during these three webinars, we'll tell you how to download the app I mentioned, how to read the maps of the property, how to fill out and submit the data sheet. So stay tuned because we will be answering all the questions that you all probably have, and we will give you all the training that you will need to confidently conduct your own forest bird habitat assessment and become champion volunteers. Great, thank you, Kelly. I'm gonna just take a quick peek at the, the chat, or uh, Eileen, do you know, is, is there any questions on the chat that we should answer at this time? Uh, well, actually one just popped up that uh, it, it would be good to address during, uh, during this presentation. Um, Catherine is saying she doesn't have an iPhone or another phone with the capabilities that you are mentioning. So uh, what would be the options for doing the forest bird habitat assessment? So we are planning on, uh, we have enough volunteers that we can group people together so we can have a couple people going. Okay. Yeah, and um, the Avenza app is, is a, you know, something that is a tool basically that volunteers can use to uh, you know, kind of uh, navigate a property um, and maybe mark a point um, on the property if they see a particular feature that they want to be able to uh, have put on a map. Uh, but it isn't necessarily 100% necessary. Um, the properties that uh, volunteers will be assessing um, are, you know, maybe 30 acres tops and a lot of them are quite a bit smaller. So if, uh, you know, somebody does not have, you know, doesn't have a, a high-tech phone and can get the Avenza app, um, you can make sure that they're also at one of the smaller properties where they're, they're certainly not going to have to worry about getting lost in the woods or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So um, that's yep. something we can take into consideration. So um, I would say maybe just for Catherine to let, have her ask her to, to let Kelly know that that's the case. And then and when we're sort of assigning volunteers to uh, properties, we can make sure that she's at one of the smaller properties um, where she wouldn't really need the, the Avenza app. Yeah, if it makes anybody feel better, I did bird habitat assessments all last season without an Avenza app. Never, never missed it. <laughs> Great. Any other questions in the chat box right now? Uh, no, I think we can proceed. Okay, great. Um, so Everyone has heard from Kelly about, you know, sort of what we're asking of volunteers in terms of training. Um, participate in the three webinars or at least watch them. Uh, do the homework assignments, come on one walk at a land trust property, and then we're asking you to go out and do a uh, habitat assessment, uh, either on your own or with a partner. We're totally fine with people pairing up um, and kind of get that if you're going out to do a habitat assessment for the first time, it might be a little intimidating. So doing it with somebody else and being able to use the, the two people's knowledge combined to do it um, would, would be a lot easier. So um, totally fine with people pairing up. And um, so then we're going to ask you, you're going to go out and do a habitat assessment, um, you know, with, potentially with a partner um, and with a landowner. And uh, I want to spend a few minutes to talk about, you know, exactly what a forest bird habitat assessment entails. Um, so you'll be out, you know, with the landowner and uh, having the landowner involved in the habitat assessment is actually key. It's an opportunity for you to get to know them and uh, learn a little bit about how they feel about their property and its management. And it's an opportunity for the landowner to learn about the birds that their property supports. Uh, while some landowners are bird watchers, others may not be aware that they have 20 to 30 different bird species living in their woodlands. Uh, the experience can be eye-opening and also can inspire action. Uh, definitely, if you can get uh, your landowner on a Scarlet Tanager, I guarantee they will be incredibly excited about their property and, and about the woods that they have on their property. Um, that, the Scarlet Tanager is like, everybody is just like, oh my god, that's amazing. I can't believe that's on my property. Um, you know, it's just one bird that really inspires people. Um, so, like I said, when you're uh, with the landowner, um, it's, it's an opportunity to get to know them a little bit. Uh, you can ask them, you know, you know, what is it about their land that, that they, they're, makes them really passionate? Um, you know, why is it they are interested in having a habitat assessment? Um, and then what are the other um, things that they think about when they're managing their land? 
uh, you know, some people might be uh, maple syrupers. Um, others might just like wild, you know, wildlife in general. Um, some might be thinking about resilience to catastrophes, um, like um, you know, emerald ash borer or uh, you know, um, gypsy moth infestations. Um, you know, others might be just sort of thinking about having a really peaceful, quiet place that they can go home to every day. Uh, but um, if they're interested in, in having um, a forest bird habitat assessment, then my guess is they are interested in birds and uh, they are interested in sort of taking some actions to try to make their properties even better for birds. Um, and that can also lead to um, other sort of ecosystem benefits or benefits for other wildlife too. Uh, when you're talking with the landowner, um, you also might want to ask them, you know, are there things that they, they would not want to do in terms of management? Uh, for example, um, some people would rather not use herbicides on their property. Um, and it's good to know, you know, what a landowner is interested in and what they're not interested in because that can impact the recommendations um, that you give a landowner um, at the end of their, their habitat assessment. We are asking um, our volunteers to learn the Connecticut birders dozen, so 12 bird species, what they look like, what they sound like, and what their habitats look like. Um, but you are free to point out other bird species that you know to landowners when you're doing the habitat assessment. The best time to do habitat assessments is in the morning. That's when birds are the most active. Um, so that is what we sort of would recommend for when it comes to scheduling the habitat assessments is doing them in the morning. Um, you know, an eight o'clock or a nine o'clock start time is fine. Uh, ideally, we would be doing the habitat assessments uh, between the middle of May and the middle of July uh, when woodland, woodland nesting birds are present, um, you know, but a habitat assessment can be done at any time of the year, you know, and this year, you know, based on current circumstances, you know, we, it is looking like we are going to have to delay the habitat assessments uh, into to mid to late summer, um, but you should still be able to see woodland nesting birds. Um, they will probably not be as vocal, so that's just one thing to be aware of. Uh, but you'll also see birds that are starting their southbound migration. And uh, if you see a group of birds flitting around in, in some shrubs, you can ask yourself, you know, why are they in that spot? Uh, is there a lot of berries? Is there good cover? Is there a water source? And a lot of the times, what makes for good habitat for woodland nesting birds is also frequently good habitat, stopover habitat for migrants. Uh, so some of the same features that you might point out to a landowner uh, um, you know, indicate, hey, this is really good for, for woodland nesting birds. Um, those same features are going to be good for migrants. So um, while it might be a little bit harder to find the woodland nesting birds just because they won't be as vocal, um, you know, any of the birds that you come across uh, and they're, what, you know, what areas they're using will, will tell you a little bit about what areas are, are important in that property for birds. Regardless of what birds you see, you want to point out to the landowner what habitat features are present on a property. Uh, that are good for birds. Are there native plants? Are there, is there dense understory or areas with dense or understory? Are there lots of brush piles? Um, these are all things that, that are good for birds. Um, also, are there fruit producing trees or shrubs like the blueberries in this photo? So the understory here, all that vegetation on the ground, that's all low bush blueberry. And if it gets enough sunlight um, in late summer, it will produce a plethora of blueberries, which Birds like catbirds and veeries um, and uh, other birds just will love and delight in, in finding that food source. Uh, and it's important to share with the landowner um, when you're walking the property of them what makes for good habitat. Uh, some people might think of, uh, you know, sort of see a lot of uh, you know, limbs and, and uh, dead trees sort of laying in the woods and sort of think it looks messy. But that is actually a really good thing for birds is having uh, piles, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> piles of brush. Um, you know, piles of brush have lots of insects associated with them. They can provide uh, protection and uh, uh, they're definitely a good feature for birds. On the opposite side of the spectrum, if you notice a lot of invasive plants, a fairly open understory with limited woody debris, <coughs> excuse me, and very few fruit producing trees, those are things that you can I might mention to the landowner um, about you know, how they might be able to improve their property. And during the second and third webinar, as well as on the walks at the land trust preserves, um, you'll be learning a lot about the habitat features that birds associate with. At the end of the assessment, um, 
you really want to fill out the data sheet. Um, you know, we're in the process, still in the process of developing the data sheet, but um, we'll definitely make sure there's lots of instructions on how to fill it out. And during our third training uh, webinar, we'll really go through uh, the wet, the data sheet and how to fill it out. But um, you want to fill it out the day that you did the assessment, so it's all fresh in your mind. Um, and then uh, when you get home, you can email that to Kelly and Hugh, uh, along with any pictures that you took. Uh, when you finish, you want to obviously thank the lawn, lawn, landowner for joining you on the assessment, uh, letting them know when they can expect to receive their report, and then um, also that they can reach out to Kelly and Hugh uh, if they have any questions in the meanwhile. And then, um, you know, one thing is if you do have a camera and you, when you're out on the assessment, you're taking pictures, um, you know, those will be great for the report, but also feel free to share those with the landowner. Um, you know, if you happen to have gotten a picture of that Scarlet Tanager and uh, can get that to the landowner, um, that will just make their day. So um, that's just something that you can, can share with them. Okay. Um, well, that's a, sort of a bit of a, an overview of what a habitat assessment entails. And uh, I'm going to take a minute or two to check the chat box, and then we'll be turning it over uh, to Eileen uh, to tell us a little bit about, you know, why manage woodlands for birds. Eileen, Corn. I'm going to um, Go ahead. I, I just wanted to let you know a little housekeeping detail. Uh, at least a few people, if not everybody, weren't able to see the poll results. So. Um, yeah, I don't know why either. <laughs> so um, when we do the second round of the poll, uh, we might need to tell people what the results are. Sounds good. Um, it was, uh, I think, uh, of the, the 17 people who took it, I think about 60% thought it was a wood thrush, and about, or let's say 40% thought wood press thrush, 40% thought uh, worm-eating warbler, and I think it was like divided between, the other two were divided between veery and the uh, oven bird, something like that. So, um, mm -hmm. Okay, Eileen, um, I, I'm gonna stop sharing and you're gonna share your part, right? Uh-huh. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing so that you can share your screen. Okay, be right with you. And we will talk about, uh, let's see. There we go. Uh, okay, so everybody should be getting a, a full screen picture of the first slide, putting birds in the picture. Um, if anybody isn't seeing that, I can no longer see the chat box, but you can uh, type questions into the chat box and someone else will alert me or answer your question. So um, not everybody thinks about birds when they think about having a woodland or managing a woodland. And uh, since we're Audubon, um, we're happy to help people put birds in the picture and managing their conserved land or their private property with birds in mind, as well as all the other things they might have in mind um, when they uh, take care of their property. And so uh, I just want to uh, remind people that when we say Audubon in this presentation, we mean the National Audubon Society, of, of which we are a part. There are other Audubon societies and Audubon chapters in Connecticut. So just be aware that when you hear that name, it doesn't always mean a single organization. Um, so uh, we're National Audubon. And uh, the reason I'm saying that is because I want to explain National Audubon's Working Lands Initiative. And uh, that is uh, outlined here. Um, it's a national program in which Audubon works with private landowners to enhance bird habitat. So it's not always forested land. Farther west, it focuses more on rangeland or on farmland. But here in the east, where we have so much forest, the emphasis is on the forested land. Now, why would Audubon forest uh, focus on people's privately owned forest instead of publicly owned forest, things like state forests and parks. Well, the reason why uh, is pretty obvious if you take a look at who owns the forest. Okay? Much of the forest that's owned in Connecticut, more than half of it, is in blocks of less than 100 acres. And more than 80% of the forest in Connecticut is privately owned. And these data are a little bit out of date, date back to 2004, but the picture is still pretty much the same. 
Uh, if you take a look at who owns forest, the state and other public lands, it's only 17% of the total. So individual ownership is really, really important. So if we're really serious about uh, protecting bird habitat or improving bird habitat, we need to be uh, uh, in partnership with private landowners. So how do we do that? Well, um, there are a lot of ways that you can consider birds when you're looking at uh, forested land. And being a bird conservation organization, we tend to look at forests through that lens. Their value is bird habitat. So here are some of the ways that we look at forests. Uh, some areas in Connecticut are called important bird areas, designated that way by Audubon because of the variety and the number of birds found in that particular area. We always also have designated forest focal areas. In other words, high priority tracts of fairly intact forested land, and we can manage and preserve that. Now, I bet you can guess that there's quite a bit of overlap between forest focal areas and important bird areas. That's not a coincidence. Uh, thriving forest bird populations require fairly good sized tracts of healthy forest, although they can also thrive in uh, some smaller spots as well. And then we've identified priority bird species that need special attention, and you'll be meeting some of those soon. But they're priority bird species, either because they're in steep decline and we're worried about their conservation status, or in some cases because they indicate special habitats uh, where they live is a place, uh, natural community that requires uh, conservation effort and, and deserves attention. So overall in Connecticut, we have about 90 priority bird species, but about 50 of those are considered forest species. Um, we're not gonna focus on all of those in this training. <laughs> we'll, we'll narrow that down some, but just so you know. But uh, if you take a look at um, the, the next bullet, that's fairly easy to figure out that a focus on birds turns out to have broader benefits for other wildlife and the health of the landscape. And ultimately it has benefits for the well-being of people. And much of that benefit, just to repeat, needs to involve privately owned land. So thank you, thank you, thank you for uh, being willing to help with this effort. Now, luckily, a lot of our interests overlap with the interests of the landowners themselves. Um, as Corey was saying, you know, why do people love their land? Well, uh, they have a lot of interests in common. So here are the forest focal areas on a percent uh, cover uh, forest focal map, focal forest area map. Um, and I'd like to just point out where the lime forest block is, um, right here near the coast. Um, just to the right of this yellow area. And um, you can see uh, that there are forest focal areas in the northeastern corner and in the northwestern corner, as well as in that lower Connecticut Valley area. If I showed you a map of the state's important bird areas, you would see a lot of overlap. So, why do forest birds matter so much from a conservation point of view? It's not just because we happen to like having birds in our forested backyards, although that is one reason, but a bigger reason is that we live in one of the richest areas of breeding birds in the United States. The Connecticut and uh, our neighbors to the north, uh, the northern New England states and even southern Canada, have some of the highest species diversity and highest densities of breeding birds in the continental United States. Those aren't all year round residents. A lot of them are the migrants that come up from the neotropics and spend their breeding seasons here. So if our habitats degrade in our forests, that has a big impact. Now this may be a very rich bird area, but as we've already mentioned, it has some problems that we need to address. Many of the priority species are in steep decline. If you look at trends between uh, uh, the first or the second breeding bird atlas um, in the last 50 years, you see some pretty serious declines. And 
that's already happened. Uh, those are trends that have happened in the past several decades. Looking forward, climate change models predict more shifts in our forest and more stresses in the breeding range of some of these birds. And what we have over here on the right is just one example. Um, the Canada warbler, whose uh, uh, range that you can see in that map, has been declining uh, by about 31%. So let's take a look at uh, what is happening to uh, one of our favorite birds, the wood thrush, kind of a flagship species. It's one of the many migratory songbirds that are declining. In fact, uh, of those neotropical migrants that are coming up and using our forests, about uh, over 40% of them are in decline. The wood thrush from breeding bird survey data has gone down about 55% over the uh, past 50 years. Um, not, not a great trend. Uh, if you take, take a look or take a listen at the yellow-billed cuckoo. I will try to get the yellow-billed cuckoo to stop making noise. There we go. <laughs> um, the yellow-billed cuckoo has gone down 52%. The rose-breasted grosbeak, which let's see if we can get that beautiful song. Uh, by the way, uh, are people hearing the song? hear it Eileen. You can hear it okay so if anybody's not hearing the songs just let us know in the chat box. Uh, the rose-breasted grosbeak whose song I hope you'll all uh, know pretty well by the end of uh, by the end of your training has also been declining. This is a bird you're fairly likely to see the way because uh, it's not too picky about staying in deep forest. Uh, the rose-breasted grosbeak is something that you can see around neighborhoods and yards as well. Um, Here's another one that, that's in a very serious decline, but not in its whole range. This is the cerulean warbler. And um, this is a bird you'd have to go into a deep woods and look way up in the canopy to see most of the time. Let's take a listen to this little guy. Okay, um, the cerulean warbler is actually not doing too badly in Connecticut. Um, one of the challenges in saving this bird is that people in Connecticut tend to own small blocks of forest and they may not manage their property in coordination with their neighboring landowners as one big chunk. So a big block owned by many people can become a bunch of separate little projects and maybe after a while it stops being a big block of forest and that's not good news for a bird like the cerulean warbler. So that opens the topic of the special requirements of each type of bird. How do we deal with that? We can't solve all their problems across all their migration and wintering spots but we can try to ensure that they have good breeding habitat so they can reproduce well and perhaps recoup some losses that uh, they're incurring on migration or on their wintering grounds. So it helps to know what they need. And that's the sort of thing we're uh, gonna try to give you a, a good eye for. In its own special way, each of these species needs cover. It might be dense vegetation. It might be some kind of woody material on the forest floor. It could be a lot of different things. It needs food. And in the breeding season, that primarily uh, means insects. Even uh, birds that ordinarily eat a lot of seeds and berries are looking for a lot of insects during the breeding season. Um, so that's important. Um, they might eat seeds and fruits. Um, Corey's already mentioned the fruits, what we call soft mast. That's particularly important after the young have fledged and right before they migrate. They wanna be fattening up on that stuff. Um, they need some place to build their nests. Most of our forest birds nest in the lower regions of the forest, which might surprise you. Um, but it's very important to maintain structure for putting nests in the lower parts of the woods. They need territories. They need space for breeding. The males define the territories, usually through song, and defend them. And one of the important features of territory is a singing perch. Um, they need to have a place to declare their territory from. So 
that's for the breeding birds. And then as Corey mentioned, our forests are also very important as migration stopovers. They're birds that are coming down from Canada uh, towards the tropics or uh, going the other way in the spring. And they need to be able to stop and rest and feed along the way. And of course we have our year, uh, year round birds that use our forests uh, all winter long. So which birds can we uh, manage for? If we're talking about 90 species of priority bird species in the, uh, in the state, 50 of them uh, might be characteristic of our forests. Um, how, do, how do we deal with that? There are over 175 bird species that breed in Connecticut, and there are even more that pass through on migration. So we have to have a way of narrowing that list down. And um, we narrow it down partly by identifying the priority birds. Um, and then we choose focal bird species. That's a little bit different. What are those? Well, first of all, they're fairly simple to identify. Altogether, the uh, focal bird species uh, use a wide range of forest types. So if you know this small number of focal uh, bird species, uh, you are looking at a whole variety of habitats that are used by a lot of other birds. They're sort of the representatives of certain general habitat types. Another thing about focal bird species is that we know we can manage the forest in certain ways that actually help them and then help the other species that, uh, that have similar lifestyles that they kind of represent. So managing for a few focal species brings broader benefits for a lot of other species. And it's easier to identify a smaller number of birds, which brings us to the birder's dozen. And um, no species have exactly the same needs, but you can manage for an awful lot of them if you focus on an, the right dozen species or the right 15 species, the right small number of species. So that's what we're going to do now. We're going to turn our attention to a dozen species of birds that we hope you'll be able to focus on learning uh, as part of this training. And Hugh is going to take us through that. Uh, but before we switch over, were there any questions that people wanted to ask about this section? So if anybody has a question, go ahead and type it into the chat. Um, Eileen, one thing uh, that was mentioned was uh, most people could hear the bird songs that you played, but um, uh, one person didn't hear one of them. Um, so I've asked Hugh to, when he does the Goes Through the Birders Dozen, to play each song twice so that hopefully everybody will hear them. Okay. And that, that might have been my oversight too, but we'll hear them all again. Great. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And you let you take it over. Okay, sounds good. We aren't seeing your screen yet, just so you yeah, know. Yeah, I just, I just yeah. lost, I was trying to open up the uh, PowerPoint and I lost the, uh, the button to share my screen. Oh. Let me, let me re try and reopen this up. Okay. Here, I'll put these, uh, the birders dozen back up for a second. Let me know when you want to share, Hugh. Yeah, yeah I will do. Maybe you can all uh, be uh, sort of thinking back to the picture that I showed at the beginning of the uh, presentation as you're looking at the uh, all the birders dozen here and see if, if maybe you want to revise your answer. <laughs> or maybe you want to keep your answer. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I, I completely lost where um, they were showing the video before the chat box and the share screen is. Uh, move your cursor. Uh, oh, I got it. I got it. It doesn't. It doesn't show up until your cursor's over it. Yep. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, we're in business. Perfect. So these um, are the birders dozen, as uh, Eileen explained before. Um, I'm just going to go over quickly uh, different ways for identifying. Oh, let me see if I can turn this off so it's not. Right. Yeah, so I'm just going to go over um, identifying by sight and sound. Um, this is the American woodcock. They're um, a small chunky bird found primarily in the eastern United States. Um, they have short legs, a short neck with a long straight bill, um, cinnamon colored underparts and a gray collar. They have broad and rounded wings. Um, I actually saw a bunch of them this weekend. I was out kayaking and coming back to the boat launch ramp. There was, it was right before dark and they were all calling and I'd watching them fly up into the sky. Wow. So in the spring, the males perform courtship flight displays, giving their call and launching into the air. I'll play the song. Yeah, volume's a little low. Okay, hang on. There it is. So um, this is the black-throated blue warbler. Um, they're a fairly large, distinctive black and blue warbler. They have a blue head and back with a black face and throat. Um, and note the white square or handkerchief on the wing. Um, they're fairly large and plump compared to other warblers and often forage in the understory and lower canopy of forests. Um, males sing to defend breeding territory and aggressively chase away rival males. And uh, yeah. just, just for comparison's sake, um, you know, while the, the male is, is a very uh, brilliant blue, um, the female is more of a, an olive green uh, bluish color um, without the black on the face. Um, but she still has the white handkerchief on the uh, wings. So whether it's a, a female, a male, or even a young bird, um, you can always identify a black throated blue warbler by that little patch of white on the wings. You can make up your own names, the black-throated blue handkerchief warbler. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is the black-throated green warbler. Um, it's a small songbird of New World warbler family. They um, have an olive green crown, um, yellow face with olive markings, and a thin pointed bill with white wing bars. Um, they have olive green back and pale underparts with black streaks on the flanks. Uh, does everybody know what a wing bar is? I mean, if you look, it, this isn't the greatest example, but if you look at that bird's wing, you can see those two little white um, uh, horizontal markings on the wings. That can often be very helpful in uh, determining what you're looking at. Uh, they're uh, plump and seemingly large-headed, um, active and agile, primarily foraging for small insects, hiding in bases of leaves of tall trees, and um, breeding males sing on exposed perches where their bright head is conspicuous. <laughs> Corey, you going to use your little memory aid here? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, when you're, when you're learning bird song, um, you know, first of all, um, one thing to mention is 
uh, you know, if they were asking you to learn 12 birds, I would start with six for this next week and then do the other six the following week. Uh, you don't want to try to do too many at one time because uh, you'll kind of get them confused. And then um, when you're sort of looking at an individual bird, maybe looking at the picture of a black throated green warbler um, and listening to its song, you kind of want, if, one way that I, I find is really helpful for learning bird songs is coming up with a really silly little saying or something you can re remember pretty easily um, about that bird song. So, you know, the black throated green warbler, some people say it goes, Z, 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 Z. I think it's singing strangers in the night. So this is the Sinatra of the songbirds. Um, it also makes another song which goes trees, trees, murmuring trees. So you can either listen for a trees, trees, murmuring trees or strangers in the night. So <laughs> those are the, the two mnemonics that I tend to use for a black throated green warbler. And again, the sillier, the better. <laughs> Uh, this is the chestnut-sided warbler. Um, they're a New World warbler. They breed in eastern North America and southern Canada. Um, somewhat stocky and stout build for a warbler. Um, they often hold their tail above their wings. Um, breeding males have a yellow crown, black mask, white checks, and chestnut sides. And uh, as I mentioned, a slim warbler with a relatively long tail that often holds cocked or raised above the body line, which makes the tail appear longer. Um, they flit and hop along slender branches, carefully inspecting the undersides of deciduous leaves. And <laughs> this one, I, ever since Corey has said this, I, I can't unhear it, but they go, please, please, please to meet you. Yeah, sounds not coming through too well. Okay. Hmm. But you can take our word for it. It really is. Please, please, please to meet ya. I'm yeah, going the... to try it again? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, uh, that one's not a very characteristic uh, classic recording, but... Uh, yeah. We'll have we'll have a chance to listen to more examples later. Yeah, with the chestnut cider warbler, that, that micha at the end is is really the very distinctive part. Um, these guys can sound sometimes a yellow warbler can sound like a chestnut cider warbler. The yellow warbler says sweet, 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 little more sweet, but there's there's no really emphatic ending to that. So um, you know the chestnut side is that please, please, please to micha. You know, there's a very distinct ending to it, um, and that's that's sort of how you can separate this one from the the yellow warbler. Um, you know, there's you can also separate them kind of by habitat, and we'll without being talking about the habitats that these birds use during the second second webinar. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, these are not the only chances you'll have to listen to these birds. There there are tons of uh, apps and computer websites where yeah, um, internet websites where you can um, access these bird songs and listen to examples if you need to. I'll be including the link to um, some of our favorite spots online to listen to the birds in the follow-up email that I send all, all the uh, volunteers. Great, thanks. Okay, so um, this is the uh, Eastern Wood Peewee. They're um, a small flycatcher from North America. Um, they're medium-sized olive gray flycatcher with a peaked head and two wing bars. Um, Eastern wood peewees are sit-and-wait predators that sally out from arboreal porches after insects and return to the same or nearby perch. And I know we're, we're not talking about invasives in this, but this, in this particular picture, it, it is uh, perched on a euonymus or burning bush. I think we'll be going over that in one of the next sessions. <laughs> what was that bird in the background, Corey? Ah, <laughs> uh, 
I think you need you to play it again. <laughs> yeah. One of those things was not a peewee. <laughs> There's the peewee. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a warbling vireo? Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. Well, just a little digression there, sorry. Now the one thing to, uh, to know, I mean, as we go through this, um, these, uh, these birds is that this is really the most incredible time to, to go out and be learning birds because um, all of these birds, you know, uh, have you know, spent their winter in the tropics and they will, almost all of them will re be returning to Connecticut in the next two weeks. So, um, and then they, they arrive, they're gonna just be singing their hearts out. So um, you'll be learning them on your computers, you know, trying like, at various websites, but then when you go outside and go for a walk, you, you probably won't be able to avoid coming across some of these species. So, um, then one neat little fact about the Eastern wood peewee is uh, a lot of people think about woodpeckers as being cavity nesters or, or birds that nest in holes in trees. Um, but there's a lot of other birds that nest in holes in trees too. And the eastern wood peewee is a, is a cavity nester. Hmm. Um, so this is the uh, Louisiana water thrush. They're actually one of the earliest migrants to return. Um, I actually often see them near my mom's house because she has small little streams and rivers. Um, they're a large, somewhat plump warbler that looks like a thrush with its long legs and long body and stout bill. Um, they have a light brown back with a white eyebrow stripe that is wider at the rear and heavily streaked white breast. Yeah, they often perch and forage in vegetation on the ground or at the water's edge. So this is a, a bird species that um, has returned already, um, you know, probably maybe about two weeks ago, they started showing up in Connecticut and Eileen wakes up to them every morning. Um, but uh, <laughs> I, I remember them as, you know, so I think when I try to remember this bird song, I, I think, okay, Louisiana water thrush, Louisiana, got to get my, my southern accent going. And then I say, hey, 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 watch where you're going. And that, that's how I remember Louisiana water thrush. Um, Another way of sort of explaining their call is the, the emphasis is on the hey, 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 and then the, uh, the watch where you're going is, is kind of less emphasized. It's more hurried and, and just quick and quieter. So um, bright at the beginning, not as, as exciting towards the end. It's another way to remember the species. Um, this is the uh, pileated woodpecker, um, a large woodpecker with a striking red crust. Um, they're insectivorous bird, um, inhabitant of deciduous forests. Oh, I guess, I guess we'll go over that grid um, in more detail when we talk about uh, habitats. Um, they're a large black woodpecker with white stripes on the face, continuing down the neck in a red crest and a long chisel-like beak, um, which is roughly the same length as the head. Um, females have the red crest, but don't have the red cheek stripe. And um, they have broad wings with visible white patches when in flight. So definitely very distinctive when they're in flight. Yeah, these I see near my mom's house all the time as well. I had a pair in my yard today. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Yeah. And definitely those white wing patches when they fly are, are they're like, oh, well, that was a pileated woodpecker. Um, <laughs> yeah, another thing that will give away that there are woodpeckers on a property, uh, uh, pileated woodpeckers on a property is um, holes in branches or tree trunks that are rectangular uh, in shape mm -hmm. or, uh, or rounded rectangles. The other woodpeckers uh, tend to form round holes. But when you see the oblong or rectangular ones, you're, you're looking at a pileated woodpecker hole. <laughs> cool. 
pretty distinct. Yeah. Kind of makes you want to run for cover. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is the Scarlet Tanager. Um, they're a stocky songbird with a thick, blunt-tipped bill. Um, the breeding males have unmistak are unmistakable with their bright red bodies and black wings and tails. Um, they have thick, rounded bills suitable for catching insects and eating fruit. Um, the head is fairly large and the tail is somewhat short and round. Um, the females and immatures are olive yellow with darker olive wings and tails. And after breeding, the adult males molt to a female-like plumage but with black wings and a tail. Uh, they're primarily insectivorous during summer and also eat fruit during migration and on the wintering grounds. Yeah, this is a bird uh, that people are often surprised to know is on their property because it spends a lot of time in the canopy. And you'd be surprised at how such a bright red bird can be invisible if it's just behind mm -hmm. one or two leaves. Um, so people could have this bird on their property and not spot it unless they know what it sounds like. So um, it's, it's really helpful to know the, this, the song and the call of this bird. Yeah, I know I had them on my, my property growing up as a kid, and I only remember seeing them a few times. Yeah. So here we go. Now, sometimes the um, the song of this bird, you know, the chirly chulo, chirly chulo, is sort of similar to an American robin, and and until you uh, kind of sort of see a see a scarlet tanager and then hear it at the same time, you know, that, then it kind of gets cemented into your brain. But it, it can be similar sounding to the robin, but the call note of the scarlet tanager, that chick burr, is incredibly distinctive. Um, you know, so I think more more often than not, I, if I hear the chick burr, I'm like, oh, there's definitely a scarlet tanager around. Um, and that can almost be an easier thing to remember than the actual song. So um, really, really try to listen to that, that chick burr a few times when you're reviewing this bird, just to get that, that sound uh, sort of in your brain. And, and just by the way, the females are more the color of the background in this photo uh, than red. Uh, they're, they're more of an, a nice olive green with the black wings and tail. So, um, this is red-eyed vireo. Um, they're a large chunky bird with a long angular head, a uh, thick neck, and a strong long bill with a small but noticeable hook at the tip. Um, they have a stocky body and a fairly sh and the tail is fairly short. Um, they're olive green above and clean white below. I have a, a gray crown and a white eyebrow stripe or supercilium um, bordered above and below by blackish lines. Um, this is a beery. They're um, medium sized with a plump body and a round head, um, fairly long wings and legs. Uh, they're uniformly bright cinnamon brown above with indistinct spotting on the chest and pale underparts. Um, they forage on the ground and in logs for invertebrate prey, peering around and then moving a short distance and repeating the process. Uh, their, their call is a beautiful downward spir spiraling song, which they often give in late spring and summer, especially at dusk and dawn. Hmm. Uh, the way I remember 
for the very song um, is it sounds like the bird is being uh, is calling while it's being dropped down a big metal pipe. You know, as it as it spirals downward, you can you can hear its voice. That's a good way to remember it. I mean, it it to I agree. It does sound like that. Yeah. Definitely. Now, one thing to notice about the viri, um, you know, and I, I think uh, Hugh said this, is that the, um, the spotting on this bird is pretty weak um, versus the, the next bird you'll see has very, very distinct spots. So they're sort of similar in, in color and, and shape, but one has very indistinct spots and one has very distinct spots. And before we leave the viri, uh, one thing that can be kind of hard to notice in the field, but if you, you get a good look at it, sometimes it helps. The viri's legs are kind of pink and uh, that can be different from other look-alikes. So um, this is the worm-eating warbler. Um, they're a small songbird um, with a uh, buffy head and underparts, um, black crown stripes, and a stripe through the eye. Um, breed in Eastern US, migrate to Southern Mexico and Central America for winter. Um, the brown to olive brown back with a black head stripe and black stripe through the eye. And uh, this is a uh, wood thrush. They have a brown back, heavily spotted, um, white breast. Uh, they're a ground forager for insects and earthworms um, associated with leaf litter. Um, they're kind of like a kind of a pot-bellied thrush with a short tail and upright posture. Um, they're reddish brown above um, and white with bold blackish spots below. And the spots are very distinctive. No, that, that call reminds me of my mom's house. <laughs> mm -hmm. but definitely the shattering glass sound at the end is very distinctive. Yeah, yeah so just um, for, we had a couple of quick homework assignments. Well, one of them is a bonus really, but uh, First was uh, for at least three species amongst the birders dozen, um, maybe go out on a hike and take a picture of the bird, its habitat, or um, try to record its song. And for a bonus, um, I, there's a YouTube video that I, I have included here that um, explains how to use the eBird app. So create an eBird account if you don't already have one, and go on a hike and submit an eBird checklist. And then email your pictures, recordings, and checklist to Kelly. So just a, a little bit about eBird, because I don't think we, we haven't really talked about that um, at all during the, the presentation. And, and this is why it's a bonus. Uh, but eBird is, a, is an app that you can get on your phone, or it's a, it's a website as well, um, you know, eBird.org. And uh, it's a site where, um, you know, bird watchers, birders, um, you know, can record what birds they're seeing on a hike, on a walk, in their backyard. Um, and it's a fun way to sort of keep lists. Uh, like I have a, an eBird list for my, my backyard that those two pillied woodpeckers I saw got, got entered onto. Um, you know, and I keep lists for the places that I go birding. Uh, but another thing that's great about eBird is that all of that information that is collected through eBird is available to scientists to be able to use. And um, you know, one way that eBird data is being used in Connecticut right now is because uh, we have um, a bird atlas going on. It's a, a five-year project where uh, a University of Connecticut, the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, and a whole list of other partners are working together to inventory uh, what birds are breeding in Connecticut during the breeding season, what birds are overwintering in Connecticut um, during the, the first part of the winter, which is November and December, 
and then the latter part of the winter, which is January and February. And then also they're going to be um, creating models that predict what, where you can, where bird species that are migrating through Connecticut can be found in the spring and in the fall. And um, one way that people can participate in the bird atlas is by uh, going birding and creating checklists on eBird and then sharing those checklists with um, CT Bird Atlas uh, at, I think it's just CT Bird Atlas. And uh, it's, it's a, you know, it's kind of a fun, a fun app, a fun program. And, uh, you know, it's a, just a little bonus if you want to give it a shot. Um, you know, it's one way that you could potentially sort of uh, be uh, keeping a checklist of birds when you're out on a habitat assessment. <clears throat> Okay, so um, yeah, I included a link here. Um, the easiest way to find the video would just be to do a simple search for eBird tutorial. Um, I believe the video is by, it's from um, an Audubon branch. I can't remember the exact, I could look it up. Um, but it's a, just a quick YouTube video and it has clear, uh, concise directions on how to access eBird, create an account and start recording your sightings. And they go very, um, very easily step by step. I'll include that link in the email that I send to everyone afterwards. Okay. Yeah, some of the um, uh, decline data that uh, we were seeing earlier on in the presentation about you know how birds been doing the last uh, 50 years, a lot of that information was collected uh, not just by scientists but by people who were out birding and participating in breeding bird surveys. Uh, so never doubt that. Um, Everybody is needed in uh, in this effort to uh, track what's going on with the bird populations. Okay, well, um, Hugh, if you want to close your presentation, um, I can throw up the picture of our our bird from the beginning again, and we can we can redo the pool poll and we'll see how everybody does. <laughs> so let me just get the, get to that slide myself. Okay, there is our bird. Oh, I'm sorry about that. And uh, let me reopen the poll. Okay, relaunching the poll now. So here's, here's how, we, how we did in the beginning. I can see it in front of me right now. Uh, 24 yeah. people, 24 percent of people thought it was a veery. Uh, 29 percent thought it was a wood thrush. 29 thought worm eating warbler and 18 percent thought oven bird. Pretty even split. Pretty even. So we're relaunching the poll. Let's see how we all do. Give it 15 more seconds. Okay, I'm going to end the poll. And, and I realize now there is a share results button. And as you can see, all right, everybody <laughs> did a great job and, and uh, figured out that this was in fact a Viri. Um, and great uh, job, everyone. Yeah, excellent job. So and like I said, um, this one has as much the less distinct spots compared to the wood thrush. Um, Eileen noted the, the pink legs. And, Which are um, not very pink in this not picture. Not very pink in this picture. <laughs> um, and uh, in the woods, you might hear it going veer, veer, or that descending spiral as it falls into a, a well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, any, any, so I think we have kind of gotten through, um, you know, all of the uh, topics that we wanted to, to hit on today. Uh, so if anyone has any question, other questions, you know, please go ahead and throw them into the chat. Um, we're going to hang on, we're going to stay on for another 10 minutes just to, to answer any questions folks have. Um, and thank you all for participating tonight. Uh, as, as Kelly indicated, we are, are so excited to have all of you um, volunteering for this project. Um, you know, it, it's just going to, it's so awesome to have all of your help. And, uh, you know, we, we couldn't be more grateful. So thank you. And well, we'll see you next time.
stay tuned. We will have um, some emails coming out to you this week. And of course, we'll, um, I'll send you an email uh, a few days before the next webinar so that you can uh, be reminded because I know it's, um, I love to have reminders all the time. So um, watch for a, a few emails and um, send us your, send us your homework. When you go outside and you go for a hike and, and, and you hear some of these birds and even if you can't get a photo of them because often they're on the treetops, but take a picture of the, of the habitat that they're in and, or, or their sound and email it in and we would love to be able to see that. Okay, we did have a few questions come in. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna answer them uh, in the order they came in. So um, Catherine, uh, do go ahead and send an email to Kelly um, to introduce yourself. And uh, her email is kelly.morgan at audubon.org. And uh, maybe Kelly, you can write that in the chat too so she can see it. Um, Doug, great idea to email the Birders Dozen PowerPoint to everybody. I think that is totally doable. So um, Hugh, if you can send your PowerPoint um, to Kelly, she can make sure to include that in the email to everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, Catherine also asked, um, she uh, lives in Colchester and, and wants to know if there are other volunteers who live in Colchester uh, who would be interested in partnering with her. Um, maybe one thing we can do is, uh, you know, is maybe we can make a, a, a list of, uh, you know, the, all the volunteers and where they live and uh, you know if if you know who who it might make sense for them to pair up with. Um, Mary asked, um, "Do individual landers, landowners come to Audubon for assessments?" And uh, you know, for this project, we have been uh, advertising um, that we're going to be doing habitat assessments this summer. Um, and I believe we have uh, 15 landowners sent, set, signed up uh, for 15 uh, private landowners signed up for habitat assessments. Um, four land trusts, as well as the Nature Conservancy, and uh, actually one more private landowner. And then um, uh, Deba asked if the Audubon Bird app uh, for the iPhone is a good choice to use when assessing land. Um, and I, I think she's probably asking, is that a, um, is it good, is it helpful for identifying birds? Uh, Eileen, have you used the Audubon Bird app, or, or uh, Kelly, have you used it? it uh, actually, I have to admit that after I downloaded the Merlin Bird app from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, I didn't have any room left on my phone for the Audubon app, too. So, um, I, sorry, I can't tell you. Um, but both of them, I think, would be, would be perfectly useful for uh, helping identify birds in the field. Actually, I was just typing an answer to that question. And uh, what I wanted to add um, is, uh, if you are using these apps in the field, you just wanna be careful not to play uh, songs where uh, the, the birds on territory can hear you and it might actually agitate them because they might think uh, there is a bird on their territory. But if you need to just play it a uh, song to confirm what you think you're hearing for identification, um, uh, it, it can be very helpful. Did that make sense? I was trying to type and talk at the same time and I'm not sure which I messed up. <laughs> okay, and then um, somebody asked about uh, sharing an eBird checklist um, with the Connecticut Bird Atlas. And you know what? I will demonstrate that right now. Uh, let me just close my PowerPoint. And uh, you need to stop sharing the polling results too. Oh, okay. How do I? Let's see. Where's the poll? Do you still see the polling results? Okay. Uh, yeah, oh. I'll close the window. Is anybody else still seeing the polling results? Because maybe you're not. No, nope, I Is don't. It? Okay. okay. Great. So let me. I'm going to just open up eBird right now. And uh, I went. Uh, I went bird watching this morning. And I submitted an eBird checklist um, for a place called Fresh Meadows Preserve. And uh, when I was on that walk, I had a mallard that had 12 ducklings. And I, I indicated that, um, you know, I put a breeding code in there for recently fledged young. Not that they've fledged, they certainly aren't flying, but they have left the nest. And uh, yeah. to uh, share that checklist, let's see here. There is a little button here that says share. 
So I'm going to share it. And then I've also shared with the Bird Atlas a number of times. So CT Bird Atlas without any spaces. Share checklist. That's how you do it. Even I could do that. Nice. Good job, Eileen. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's a question on the in the chat box. When is the homework due? If it came in by the next webinar, that would be great. Then we could discuss it on the next webinar. Um, I, I suppose if it was, if we had some really bad rains and people weren't able to get out, you know, if um, th th we'll be lenient with that. But I think um, I think there'll be time in the next couple of weeks to get out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the, I, I'm pretty sure at least Sunday this weekend is supposed to be quite nice. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, any, any other questions? Uh, do people know, um, about Ken's birding webinar, is it too late to sign up for that bird ID series? I know he's already uh, probably done two sessions. Do you think he'll be offering it again for people who want to learn about bird identification? Well, I'd tell you what, we'll, we'll find out about that. And if there's an opportunity, we'll, we'll let people know. But just, uh, just wanted to share that um, Audubon is offering some, some online bird bird identification series. And looks like there's some interest in that. So um, yeah. um, maybe um, I think uh, let's, uh, let's look into that. Let's reach out to Ken and we'll, we'll find out uh, if he's going to, if people can still sign up for the one that's currently taking place or if there'll be uh, another offering. As it sounds like, I imagine there's interest. So yeah, looks like there's a lot of interest. Great. <laughs> Good. Um, and, and there's a, a question about pulling barberry. Uh, is there any reason not to pull as much invasive barberry as I can and how do I dispose of it? Um, the only reason not to pull as much invasive barberry as you can is uh, if pulling all of it would leave a completely bare forest floor and you know that you've got birds that are already using that cover. So like right now, and correct me if I'm wrong, Corey, about the timing of this, right now might be about as late in the season as you want to be um, removing cover that birds might be using for nesting. Um, but other than that, uh, there's no such thing as pulling too much barberry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, disposing of it though is, can be, um, uh, can be an issue because you don't want to leave it someplace where berries are going to drop off and, and reseed in. And I see Catherine uh, is sharing good information on invasive plant removal and uh, in place of invasive plant removal timing. Um, so yeah, Catherine, if you could share that web link, uh, that would be great. We can, we can try and get that to everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I appreciate your sharing the info. Yeah, there, um, there isn't necessarily berries on the, the barberry this time of year. Uh, I think more uh, the time of year you'd wanna be careful is in, in the fall. That's when they would, you know, late summer, early fall is when they would have berries on them. Um, you know, so at that point, if you were just pulling them and then making a brush pile with them, you know, all the berries are still there. Um, so you might want to think about potentially bagging them up or, um, you know, let them decompose on a tarp or something like that, or on a bunch of cardboard to try to prevent all the berries from just entering the seed bank. Yeah, April is a good time to pull it because it's so easy to see. Uh, it really shows up because there's not much else that's green. Yeah, I would think that a brush pile is fine for right now. Um, and I think that's something, yeah, when you, you know, certain plants like, uh, and, and the, Kathy just shared the link to the, the, uh, the invasive, uh, to the SIPWIC, which is the Connecticut Invasive Plant uh, Work Groups. Uh, they have a PowerPoint, or they call it the Invasive Plant Calendar, um, which goes through the sort of top 10 invasives in Connecticut and talks about uh, the various techniques for removing them and how to dispose of them. So. I think you just want to, you know, with disposable, you want to keep in mind, um, you know, does the plant have berries? You know, if it has berries, you probably want to, you know, bag it up if you can and get rid of it, um, you know, or put something underneath it if you're letting it decompose. And then there are some species that can 
that um, are just plain hard to kill. You can pull them up and they will reroute. Um, so uh, I think off the top of my head, I'm not quite sure which those are, but um, that calendar will tell you. Um, but that's you know just one thing you want to be careful about with invasives. Is it's good to check and understand um, what the best way to dispose of them is. There are specialized tools for certain kinds of invasive uh, plants. Uh, one of the ones that I found works really well, and you know this isn't a commercial. I have uh, no particular interest in pushing a product, but one that I found that works well is something you might find online called the honeysuckle popper. Hmm. And obviously it's designed for honeysuckle, but it works pretty well on barberry as well. Hmm. Good to know. Hmm. And uh, Mary asked if she could tell her friends about um, the habitat assessment training. Um, go, yes, I think it's not too late to, to sign up um, because, you know, as we said, these webinars are being recorded. Um, so if somebody misses the first one, they definitely can, you know, just go back and watch the recording. Um, and uh, if they want to sign up, um, you know, just reach out to send an email to Kelly Morgan, um, you know, Kelly .auto, Kelly .morgan at Audubon org, And uh, uh, that's how you can sign up. And we would love to have additional people. And Kelly, do you have the link to uh, Ken's bird ID webinars? Because we could I provide that. Yeah, I don't believe so, but I will get it and then send that right. in the email. Great, thanks. I have a question. It, it's um, I'm not sure what I'm hearing when I go for my daily walk, and I was wondering if you guys can identify it for me. It goes something like um, cheeseburger, 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 cheese. Oh yeah, yep. Uh, uh, the bird books will tell you it's witchity, 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 witch. Uh, do you see goldfinches in your uh, in your area? Um, I have not. Oh seen no 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 no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Corey, uh, slap me upside the head. Uh, <laughs> slap. Yeah. Um, uh, but I, I'm, I'm not thinking uh, uh, goldfinch just, <laughs> you take it over, Corey. <laughs> well, I, I, well, so first my question to the, the person asking the question is, yeah. uh, is it now that you're hearing that bird? Um, did you hear it for the last few weeks? Or is it something you heard for the first time like today? Well, I, I've noticed it over the last few weeks as I'm going out for my daily walks. And I just... It's such a pretty song and I can't figure out, like I've been listening to audios trying to figure out which bird it is and I can't figure it out. So, yeah, um, just so you know, I was thinking that it was a common yellow throat, which would not be here right now. So uh, give it a week. They'll be here in a week, yeah. Eileen. You're getting yeah, ahead yeah. of schedule. But yeah. uh, right. Aaron actually suggested Carolina Wren and I, I think that's a pretty good suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, you sort of think yeah. of it as saying cheeseburger. I think it says tree hugger. So uh, a loud, jubilant tree hugger, tree hugger, tree hugger uh, is how I think of Carolina Wren. So maybe give that one, look that one up and see if you think that's it. Yeah, uh, the, the books will tell you tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, let's see, uh, here it is. I don't know if you can hear it from my computer. Coming right, in. well, I've got to wait for it to load. And it might take too long. Well, now, now, now you've got me go. to pull it up too. Yeah. I don't know if you can hear it. Yeah, that's it. Great. Yeah. Okay, now how do I get it to stop? <laughs> <laughs> And it's like that in real life, too. They'll do it forever. <laughs> okay. Um, any final questions? Had some great questions, by the way. Um, you guys are clearly are, 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 your brains are already turning. You're, you're asking great questions about invasive plants, about the birds. Um, any final questions that folks want to ask for tonight? Well, I'm glad to see everyone seemed to enjoy it. Yeah. A lot Thanks of good comments here. Yeah.
making us feel good. Thank you all. <laughs> Okay, well, um, I want to thank everybody for participating tonight. Um, Kelly will be in touch with follow up information. And, um, you know, we look forward to talking with you in two weeks at our next webinar, uh, which is going to be about um, plants. It's very plant oriented. We'll be learning about uh, native trees and native shrubs that are beneficial to birds. Um, Eileen will be talking about, you know, the difference between native plants versus invasives and also about some native plants that people commonly think are invasives um, and why they're actually kind of good to leave on your property if you can. Um, and then um, we're also gonna be learning about those invasive plants. So we'll have Eric Hansen, the, the forester we work with, um, as well as Eileen um, on that next webinar. And I think it's gonna be a, a, great, a, great, a great learning experience. And then we'll also dive into the habitats of our birders dozen. So, uh, look forward to seeing everybody in two weeks or talking to everybody in two weeks. And thank you all so much for tuning in tonight. Thanks all. Thanks guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Do you guys want to stay on for a second or shall we, uh, just reconvene? Hi Diva. Hello. Did you enjoy it? How are you? Nice job, everyone. I'm very proud of my students. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did a great job, both of you, all of you, actually. But yeah, thank you. Awesome. Yeah, thank all you right. for, for tuning in, Diva. It's great to have you. Oh, thanks. Yeah, Absolutely. Thanks. It was fun. I really enjoyed it. So I'll definitely see you in the net for the next one in two weeks. Great. Great. Right, so awesome. You. I'll thank you. Guys you. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Michael. Hey, Kelly. <laughs> thanks for joining us. Yeah, no problem. Tell you, Corey, I just have to not let my mouth get ahead of me with bird ID. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're so excited. You can't wait to hear the first witchity, witchity, witchity yeah. of the season. Well, so. there's, you know, that bippity, 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 it really can be several birds. And I've been hearing Carolina wrens for like three months, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think the Carolina wrens really ever stop. You know, yeah. they, they have, they sort of switch to a different song during the, the they're one that they seem to switch their song with season. Um, they yeah. have a different song that you hear in the fall. And, uh, you know, for a long time, it, it actually, I was like, what is that bird? I don't know what that bird is. You know, they don't teach that one on like the bird song guides. And I finally saw a Carolina wren doing it. And then I'm like, now I know it's a Carolina wren. Mm -hmm. Well, some of them, you just have to learn by tone of voice rather mm -hmm. than by exactly what they say. You yeah. know, it's like recognizing the sound of a particular musical instrument. Mm -hmm. Yep. The Baltimore Oriole is an example of that. They exactly. they don't sound the same. None of them say, gives exactly the same song, but it's the that it's so cheery. I think of them as the cheer. I always think so. My way of remembering Baltimore Orioles is they're bright orange. They're they're like the cheerleaders of the bird world, and their call is just their song is just super cheery. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, very very upbeat. Yeah, yeah. You think someone wrote them into a musical or something yeah. like that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, okay, I'm going to sign off if we're done for tonight. Uh, you yep. know, we can debrief tomorrow if you want, but. Uh, we've got our, our 9 a.m. call tomorrow. So, um, you know, we're going to definitely debrief tonight, okay. you know, to, okay. tomorrow morning. So, Eileen, if you want to pop on for five, 10 minutes tomorrow morning, um, just yeah, to, I, to touch I, base, I, that would be great. Yeah. But uh, nice going, everybody. This yeah. was fun. Great Thanks. job, Super. everyone. Okay. Have a good night, like all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.